and then we flip the person over in the back. The base of the head is our two trigger points there. Um, the upper neck and shoulder area. The upper buttocks, which is we call the sacroiliac joint area back here. And then the hips area over here. So there's a total of 18 tender points. And to classify with fibromyalgia, you need 11 of these 18 points being positive. So the American College of Rheumatology in 1993, they made the criteria, you need 11 of these 18 being positive. The pain must be going on for greater than three months. And the reason for that is a lot of times people will get a viral syndrome. And they get a virus and they have these tender points, this chronic pain, but that will go away within six to eight weeks. So you don't have fibromyalgia. That's just a temporary condition. So you need the pain for greater than three months. The pain must also be on both sides of the body, right and left. And the reason for that <coughs> is that you could get pinched nerves, you could get a herniated disc that will cause just one-sided pain, um, and it's not true fibromyalgia. And you'd be disservicing the patient if you're treating them for fibromyalgia without looking for an underlying problem. The pain also must be above and below the waist. So you can't have just upper extremity problems or just leg problems. It has to be both upper and lower to make the diagnosis. And the most important thing is you must exclude other diseases at this time. So what other conditions can be mistaken for fibromyalgia? And this is basically the part of the initial work of it. Well, hormonal imbalances. I see this with diabetics. People who have uncontrolled diabetes will have chronic pain and chronic tender points. Um, thyroid diseases, whether it's overactive or underactive thyroid, needs to be ruled out, thank you, um, for this condition. One of the biggest ones is hormonal, especially with the female population, hormonal imbalances. Um, perimenopausal women will get this very frequently. Um, young menstruating women during times of their cycles will get a lot of tender points out of the ordinary. So we have to rule that out first. Infections. Now we're talking more chronic infections. And the two most common ones that we see is Epstein-Barr, which we have definitely linked over the last few years, a link between Epstein-Barr infection and fibromyalgia leading to chronic pain. And Epstein-Barr is the infection that causes mono. Whether you had full-blown mono or not, if you were exposed to it, which the majority of the population has been exposed to it, you can lead to fibromyalgia. Another one is Lyme disease. And that one I've, I've caught in a few patients who came in for fibromyalgia and they actually have Lyme disease. And once you treat that, all the symptoms of pain goes away. Then we go to autoimmune disorders. And which autoimmune disorders? Well, like I said, muscle problems like polymyositis, the most common one in the elderly or the older population is polymyalgia rheumatica, which is a whole other issue, but it's a condition where there's active inflammation in the shoulder and hip girdle, but there's a lack of these other tender points. But it gets misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia extremely, extremely frequently. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis can do it, lupus can give fibromyalgia, and again, it's always treating the underlying condition and then addressing the fibromyalgia if it still persists. Neurological conditions, multiple sclerosis, can present as fibromyalgia symptoms, as well as something called myasthenia gravis, so we have to look at that. Psychiatric illnesses, that's also pretty common. Underlying depression, anxiety, can manifest as chronic pain. And you see some commercials for that a lot of times that, you know, where does it hurt? It hurts everywhere. And it does. A lot of times when you're stressed, you manifest it outwardly with chronic pain. Um, malignancies, I put that down too because early malignancies at times, it's not common, but can also cause this chronic kind of fatigue and fibromyalgia type pain. So that needs also to be addressed and make sure age appropriate cancer screenings are always up to date in someone with these complaints. And the other one is hypercalcemia, meaning high calcium levels in the blood can cause chronic pain with fibromyalgia. So you can see there's other reasons that could be mistaken for. And once you treat these underlying problems, a lot of times the fibromyalgia pain will go away. Okay, so what are the characteristic features of fibromyalgia? Well, it's widespread body aches and widespread pain, and that's in about 100% of the people who come in. Just, you need that for diagnosis. Fatigue is in about 70%. I'm saying, I personally see it about close to 100% too, associated fatigue with this. And whether it's due to poor sleep or whether it's just due to being in chronic pain and you feel fatigue, it's, it really goes hand in hand with the condition. Poor sleep habits, it's, it's a huge, huge part of the 
diagnosis here. That's about 80% of people. Um, cognitive impairment, and the classic sign we see is fibro fog, where people feel like they can't concentrate, um, they, they can't remember things, and that goes along with about 20%, I think it's probably a little higher, but their studies have shown it's about 20%. Morning stiffness should be less than one hour. If it's greater than an hour, when people get up, then we're thinking of other autoimmune conditions. Um, <coughs> depression, anxiety symptoms, is only about 20% of people in studies have actual depression associated with this. Um, a subjective feeling of numbness and burning. I get that a lot. People come in and say, well, my whole body burns, and I have this like burning sensation. Well, 35% of the people, that's their manifestation of fibromyalgia, it's this burning pain. Bowel disease, and usually it's irritable bowel syndrome. A lot of people, when I go into their history, they have a history of irritable bowel or irritable bladder, like interstitial cystitis in females. Very common with fibromyalgia. Um, periodic limb movement syndrome is restless leg syndrome. 20% of people will have that as well. And then all these things kind of lead to impaired social and occupational functioning, meaning people can't go out and do the activities. They can't work anymore. And therefore, it leads to kind of more of a sedentary lifestyle and more problems with this condition. So other um, symptoms I do see, I mentioned the bowel syndromes, there will bowel um, you can get also migraine headaches with this, um, affective disorders, which are mood disorders, TMJ problems, some people complain of drug problems with this. Um, a lot of people say there are multiple drug allergies or chemical allergies associated with this condition. Um, esophageal problems, and these a lot of times are more perceived problems and there's actually a problem. When you go for further workup, there's really, you know, there's really not much else going on. Okay, true or false? Fibromyalgia is more common in females than males. True. True. Absolutely. We definitely see a higher predisposition in the female population than the male population. And um, 85 to 90 percent of the cases are actually in females. So it's, it's a much higher, higher level. It can happen in females at any age, but most commonly during reproductive years. And I see a lot during the perimenopausal period that really starts in females. Um, and in the United States, it's 3.4% of the female population is affected by this. Um, why do we think this as well? Well, hormones, number one. Um, women are typically the ones that would get autoimmune disorders or thyroid disorders and problems like that. In general, women typically have more problems with sleep than men do. And actually, the next slide shows these things. This is just basically uh, in the United States, the prevalence of chronic somatic conditions, meaning fatigue. This is people with or without fibromyalgia. They just kind of surveyed men and female in the United States. And they found that the men in the blue, the females in the gray. In all areas, females have more problems in general with tension headaches, migraine headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, fatigue in general, regional pain syndrome, and widespread pain. And it's just more common in the female population than the males. That's why we think we're seeing more of these conditions in women than men. Um, again, I personally think that a lot of it is related to hormones. I really, truly do, and I see this quite often. So, Okay, true or false? There's a new lab test that will tell me I have fibromyalgia. False. Unfortunately, there is absolutely no blood work and diagnosis for fibromyalgia. There's no antibody or no marker in the blood that will tell you, oh, yeah, you have fibromyalgia by blood work. So it becomes pretty, you know, tricky. It's basically a clinical diagnosis. <coughs> we call it a diagnosis of exclusion, um, that we have to rule out other conditions, and we have to basically check. And the panel we typically use is checking for Lyme disease. We check for thyroid disease. We check for um, iron deficiencies, um, markers of inflammation called the SED rate. I always check for um, muscle enzymes just to make sure they're not elevated. Even basic blood work to include anemia profile because anemia can sometimes do this as well. So you typically do a whole workup and if that all comes back as being negative, then you say, well, you know, fit by your exam, it looks like you may have this and blood work didn't show any other reasons to have this, so therefore your diagnosis is fibromyalgia. So what do we do for the recommended workup for fibromyalgia? You have to have a history of chronic pain, again, we said, for greater than three months. That's very important. Um, other conditions that may present with chronic widespread pain must be ruled out at that time. 
You need a general physical exam, a neurological exam, again, to rule out neurological problems, the laboratory data, like we said, and then the other part is the sleep and mood evaluation in some patients who you think may have a problem in those areas. Then after that, you confirm that the presence of tender points, you need, again, 11 of 18 of these points to be positive, and that's your diagnosis of fibromyalgia. So it's a, basically a combination of both laboratory data and physical exam to make your diagnosis. So here's a, here's a, a little case scenario. There's a 36-year-old white woman who presents with medical history of hypothyroidism and postpartum depression. She presents to a primary care physician with diffuse body pains that started about three months prior after she had a fall while shopping at a department store. She had preceding low back pain from her pregnancy, and this kind of aggravated that low back pain. Within one week of the fall, the pain spread from her low back up to her spine and down into her legs. At that point, then her sleep became disrupted, and then the pain spread to her neck, shoulders, and arms. This is a very almost classic situation I see something happening, so. So, we go with this. Is there a single event that is responsible for this fibromyalgia? Because this is a, a, a scenario I have, and then people say, well, I fell, now I have fibromyalgia. So what do you think with that? Is there a single event that will trigger fibromyalgia? This is actually a tough one. It's actually under debate, and we don't think so. We think that people are predisposed to have this. And in this, this female, um, having a history of postpartum depression makes her more susceptible. The fact that she already had chronic low back pain makes her predisposed to have this too. They think there is genetic factors involved. So this may not, people who have postpartum depression and low back pain will never, may never get fibromyalgia. And we're finding now that there's more genetic responsibility to this than we thought prior. And we're seeing clustering of this disease in families. So it's also important to ask family members if you suspect this, like your mother, your, your siblings, um, father, did you ever have chronic widespread pain? Was anyone ever diagnosed with just a muscular problem? Because a lot of times this runs in families. And we typically see it along the female lineage that it will run down. Um, they think this one gene may be responsible for it, the COMT gene, but there's still data looking into this. And hopefully, you know, years down the road, we'll be able to target this and maybe, you know, treat a medicine that will prevent symptoms. But this is way, way down the road. But at least we're getting information that this is something genetic and it's not, you know, really triggered by some kind of event. Now, once you have the genetic predisposition for fibromyalgia, then you could have environmental triggers to make this work, to make it worse, excuse me. So this fall was probably her trigger. Like she had an underlying problem and the fall just made things worse. And a lot of times it's because of the sleep problems. You start getting achiness and then this causes just widespread, more diffuse pain. So basically right now we think there's a combination of genetics as well as an environmental trigger to really start this whole thing going. And the environmental trigger doesn't have to be a physical trigger either. It could be an emotional trigger, a death of a loved one, um, stresses at work, um, stresses at home. It definitely could trigger this too. So, okay. Now, true or false? There is a belief that fibromyalgia is really a central nervous system problem. What do we think with that one? Any suggestions? True. Yeah. Can I say false with that or false? This is actually this is actually true. The whole um, gear towards fibromyalgia was initially it was a muscle problem, and that's why it got kind of geared towards more of the rheumatologist because we deal with muscles and we deal with joint pains and everything. Actually, though, the new data that's coming out, new studies with this, is showing that it actually is a central nervous system problem. It originates in the brain that there's something abnormal with signals that signify pain response. So what we have found that people with fibromyalgia, they have something called allodynia, meaning light touch, just light touches will cause pain. When a normal person doesn't have it, you can touch them and they'd be fine. However, deep stimuli, touches that really will hurt somebody are almost, they call it a hyperallergesic, it really causes a tremendous amount of pain. So it's almost a pain perception problem. So they looked into this and they said, okay, well, does this correlate with what we're seeing on MRI? So they, they did this to people with fibromyalgia. They kind of did brain scans while they were doing these trigger points and they saw that these brain activity all of a sudden started going crazy 
with light touch and with stimuli that shouldn't be causing that much pain in the body. So they went further with that and they said, okay, well, what is being stimulated in the brain? And it's something called substance P, this, um, this hormone, basically, that is hyperactive. It's, and it's substance P, it's a substance pain hormone, basically, that the brain is making in excessive amounts in people with fibromyalgia. So it's good we finally found something that may be triggering this. And what that does, it causes a release in the brain of this hormone. It travels down to the spinal cord. The spinal cord thinks that there's something irritating it, like a normal response to pain. And that sends out signals in the spinal cord to these tender points, these nerve signals saying, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, do something about this. And it becomes almost a vicious cycle because the brain senses, oh, I am in pain, let me make more of this product. It just keeps going and going and going. So we're finding that basically this is more of a neurological problem than actually a true muscle problem. Because again, there's nothing wrong with the muscles. We do blood work, we do EMG testing, there's nothing wrong there. <coughs> so um, we'll go to the next slide. So basically this is what we see <coughs> with um, neurological problems. We see a decrease in a lot of times of cortisol, um, something called the cortisol releasing factor. These are are things that we need to keep the metabolism up to keep the body going. And there's, in general, a decrease in these levels. Not to the point that we consider it a kind of a disease, but just a, a lower level than normal. This, in itself, leads to chronic pain. The pain also, we have this substance P that goes up in the brain saying, I'm in pain, that leads to pain. Um, we find also in studies that serotonin, which is something you need um, for the kind of the talking of the nerves to be regulated, um, is decreased, the amount of serotonin circulating is decreased, and also something called norepinephrine, which gives you energy, gives you, you know, things to do something. That's also decreased in general in the body. So it's a lot of more hormonal things that are going on here than just um, painful things. And all these things lead to chronic widespread pain in the body. Okay, and this, we already mentioned, but true or false, sleep habits affect fibromyalgia. True. This is absolutely. Um, disruption, we basically have four cycles of sleep in the body. There's one, two, three, four. Stages three and mainly stage four are your restorative type of sleep where the body needs to restore its muscles, restore its joints um, to make you feel like you rested during the night. We find, and this has been documented, people with fibromyalgia never really get to their stage four sleep. They kind of subconsciously wake themselves up. They go through one, two, three, back up to one. One, two, three, back up to one. And what happens is you wake up and you don't feel like you actually slept at all. Everything's hurting, everything's aching. And a lot of times, the stage four sleep is your dream sleep. So a lot of people in the primary say, I can't remember if I dreamt or not. I don't really dream that much. And I hear that a lot. They just never get into their good sleep. Um, and reasons for that, underlying reasons, Restless leg syndrome is a big one. People with restless leg will subconsciously wake themselves up to turn around to get comfortable, and they don't even remember doing this during the night. Sleep apnea is a big, big thing. Um, and sleep apnea is a condition where people basically stop breathing or snore excessively during the night. And usually it's the spouse that says something when I'm in the office with them. They'll be like, oh, my, my wife snores like crazy, or my husband snores like crazy. But the patient's like, I don't do that. I never remember doing that. So if you can't go by a patient's account because they don't know, you need somebody else to kind of do that. So these are things we need to look for. Other things are night terrors. People who wake up with bad dreams a lot um, and have night terrors will also have abnormal sleep habits, and that is a condition. And then there's also anxiety-related insomnia. So some people just can't get to bed because their mind keeps racing, 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 racing. And as soon as they wake up for something, like they have to go to the bathroom, it takes them about an hour and a half to get back to sleep because their mind races, races. So those people as well do not get into their restorative sleep. So what do we um, basically recommend for that is going for a sleep study, just to evaluate. So um, with fibromyalgia, the treatment, what do we do to treat this condition? Initially, we recommend mild analgesics and muscle relaxants, and that's been kind of the standard of care up until a few years ago would be trying something like Advil, ibuprofen, Tylenol, and, or a prescription anti-inflammatory like Mobic or Celebrex or Naperson, 
something along those lines, and then adding a muscle relaxant. That was basically the standard of care up until we started getting medications approved for this condition. And it does work. I mean, I really, it does work. Overall, it's relatively safe, but you can't give it to people who have underlying renal problems or kidney problems. They can't take those medicines. People who are on blood thinners, it's not really safe to give those medicines to. So, um, but that's what was the initial recommendation. It had been for about 15 years. Um, also in combination with this is therapies, and we'll go into that. Um, getting blood work and then exercise is tolerated. So, now, true or false? And there are only three medications that the FDA has approved for fibromyalgia. True. That's true. There's only three FDA medications, and you probably have heard of some of these. Um, Lyrica, Cymbalta, and Civella. These are the three that have been approved. Now, the first one, Lyrica. Um, this is basically a neurological agent, Lyrica. And uh, the sister drug to Lyrica is Neurontin or Gabapentin. That's been around for, for quite a while. But this one's a newer one that came out, uh, I'm going to say about five, six years ago or so. Lyrica started really coming into fashion for fibromyalgia. It was initially approved for diabetic neuropathy pain, again, because it works for neurological problems. This is why it works for fibromyalgia. But for, neuro, for diabetic pain and also for shingles, post-shingles pain, it was indicated for initially. Then they started looking at it for just chronic pain in general, and they found it does work for fibromyalgia and pretty well. Now, it works basically by inhibiting this thing called substance P, this thing in the brain that's releasing pain. That's what Lyrica works against. Um, and they, they found with Lyrica, basically, that this is the kind of the sugar pill. We call it the placebo up there. These are different doses of the Lyrica. And they found that the higher the dose, the better pain control we had. Um, and, and you can see it definitely works. And it works. It lasts at least three months over here. They go past three months. But it definitely does work. Now, the problem with this med, it, it, when it works, it works great, really is. However, I find that it's always limited by the side effects to it. It's not a completely benign drug. 30% um, of people will get dizziness with this, and I do see dizziness occur with this medication. Somnolence, meaning you're tired. Yes, it does absolutely occur in about 20% of the patients. Waking, which is probably the most annoying and inhibiting factor of giving this to patients is the weight gain. Because most people with fibromyalgia, not most people, I should say, some people with fibromyalgia are overweight, and we find that they're, they can't exercise because of it, they're sluggish because of it, and now I'm adding more weight to it. It's not very practical to the whole um, condition. So 15% will get weight gain. Now the company always says, oh, it's no more than five pounds with Lyrica. And typically, that's it, but I have seen more. And the reason is it causes fluid retention. I'll put that down, put that down. It causes edema in the legs. So um, a lot of people will come in and they'll have all of a sudden leg swelling. And it's water retention and waking with that. So now their legs become heavier and you get more pain in the legs. So um, it's a potential problem. Dry mouth can happen with it. Blurred vision can happen with it. Nausea can happen. And fatigue. And I'll tell you, a lot of these things will be self-limiting. Like, these, the dry mouth, the nausea, the fatigue, that usually after a couple of weeks goes away, but the waking can persist, the edema can persist, the tiredness can persist with the drug. Um, what we recommend with Lyrica is starting very low and then kind of gradually building the medication up. The initial recommendation was a dose of 300 milligrams a day, and they want you to kind of start with that right off the bat. No one, none of my patients tolerate that at all. It's just really impractical. So we basically start slow, and we have to gradually get up. So it does take a while to get to that dose if a patient can actually reach that dose. So um, it works well, and it works. It really does. And if you don't have side effects, but it's sometimes hard getting to the point to make it work, basically. OK, so the other drug is Cymbalta. Now, Cymbalta was initially, it came out in the market for depression. So this is not a neurological agent. This is a medicine for depression. And what they found, um, that it works by helping more of the serotonin to circulate and more of this thing called norepinephrine to circulate. And that helps with chronic pain as well. 
So what they did in depression patients, they started off low, they escalated the dose, and they found that about half the dose needed to treat depression, these people also in their pains were going away. Um, they found that half the dose of depression, which is about 60 milligrams a day, that people started getting chronic pain relief. So they looked at this now for fibromyalgia, and they did a study, and they saw it did help with chronic pain. I um, personally like Cymbalta, the three approved ones. I personally like this one the best. I think overall it has the least amount of side effects, um, and I see the best improvement with it, especially if there is a component of underlying depression in the patient. Um, then this definitely does, does help. It also is indicated for either their diabetic neuropathy, just like Lyrica is, because they found also that it helped with neuro neuropathy symptoms. And it could help also with post shingles pain or neuropathy from there. So they're kind of the same recommendations, but two different mechanisms, how they work. <coughs> um, they found with Cymbalta, this is the, again, the sugar pill, the placebo pill. Here's Cymbalta. Here's about three months on treatment, and they show like basically the pain scales. And you can see with just a basic chart here that Cymbalta does help within three months versus being on a sugar pill or nothing. It does help reduce pain levels. <coughs> now, side effects of Cymbalta, again, I don't see as much as I do with Lyrica. Um, the first two weeks with this one is usually the toughest, and I really encourage people to, to, to get through the first two weeks. And instead of giving them the 60 milligram dose, which is the approved dose for fibromyalgia, I always start people on like 30 milligrams, half that, just to get through the side effects. But they can happen. Nausea can happen, dry mouth can happen, constipation can happen in some people. Somnolence meaning tiredness, but it's not nearly as much as with lyric of the tiredness. Um, decreased appetite can happen in 10%. Some people like that, because they actually can lose some weight. Um, and then some have complained of increased sweating. They just feel like they're perspiring. Again, all these things should really go away within two weeks. And if they don't, then we say, well, you know, is this the right drug for you? But it's usually a self-limiting thing. So the side effects are much better tolerated in general than with Lyrica. Now the last one that is approved is Civella. And this one came out about two years ago for fibromyalgia. It's an antidepressant in Europe. It's, an, it's actually been around in Europe for depression for years. Um, it never got the indication in the United States for depression, and it still does not have the indication in the United States for depression. But in Europe, they started seeing, again, just like with Cymbalta here, they saw it was helping with chronic pain. So the United States took this drug and said, well, let's just market it strictly for fibromyalgia. And that's the only indication for it. So this works kind of like Cymbalta, but it only increases norepinephrine. So this one gives you more of a, a pump, like for people who are extremely tired and can't do anything. This will kind of give them a little bit more energy than um, the other ones do. Um, it doesn't really affect the sleep, so it doesn't, like, Lyrical will help you sleep better because it makes you more tired. This doesn't do it. If anything, I have people tell me, I can't sleep. I'm a little more awake with this. And, and some people, it goes to the extreme, and they get very anxious and very jittery with it. So um, that's a limiting side effect to this one. Um, headaches can occur with this. Nausea. Um, those usually go away again from the first few weeks. But it's the, it's the effects of kind of jump-starting the metabolism a little bit, that I see diarrhea, I see with it, I see the, the anxiety, like almost jitteriness, a little bit of insomnia with it. So this one too, you have to start very slow, and we do have um, little packs, like starter packs to start this medication slow, and then gradually build it up. Otherwise, you're not gonna, you're not gonna tolerate it. They had actually one woman who the pharmacy forgot to give her the starter pack and they went right to the regular prescription and she was just, oh, I felt off the wall. Like, she just got crazy. So the body has to adjust to this, um, this happening. So it works well. Savella is, it works well too. But again, it's, it's interesting. Everybody, I think, has a different trigger of like what hormones are responsible for fibromyalgia, whether it's an increase of this substance P, whether it's increase or decrease in serotonin or decrease in norepinephrine. We can't test for that really, and I wish we could, because then we could really gear the drug to which you know condition is the responsible factor for you. And you can't do that now, so this is always just playing around with medications, unfortunately, until we find the right one for the patient. And it can take months to get this under control. It really, really can. 
Okay, so again, now analgesics and fibromyalgia, what is safe with these medications? That if, let's say we do put you on Lyrica, but you're still having pain, what can you take? Well, anti-inflammatories are, are fine. They don't, they, they don't cross-react with any of those. And again, that's like your ibuprofen, your Aleve, your Advil. You won't take it if you're on blood thinners like Coumadin and Plavix, or if you have kidney problems, that's out of the question. But anyone else, yeah, it's fine. You could add that to it just for a little bit more pain relief. Tylenol works, so so. Um, not not as great, but some people like Tylenol, Tylenol arthritis, and that's fine. You could take that. Um, tramadol, tramadol or Ultram um, did get an indication for chronic pain and fibromyalgia. Um, they kind of promoted that way, the long-acting tramadol. Um, I don't see it greatly working for the pain. Um, some people it does. Some people. Most it doesn't, but it's something out there that you can try, especially if you can't tolerate anti-inflammatories. But their company does promote it as, to, as working for fibromyalgia pain. So it's a hit or miss, and I, I would try it. I mean, give it a few weeks, see if it helps. And if not, you, you go off it. And then you can do combination therapies like Tylenol and an anti-inflammatory, you could do that for, for pain. Now, other medications, and these were these were the ones that were basically used before we got these FDA-approved medicines, and they still do work in people. And people who can't tolerate the newer medications, and there are a lot that can't, then we can go to some of the older ones. Um, the antidepressants, and there are a class called the tricyclic antidepressants. Um, the prototypical one is Elodil or amitriptyline, that's used for fibromyalgia. It does work, and I think it works more by inducing sleep, to be honest with you. It um, makes people very tired, and that's a side effect um, to it. But they get better sleep with it, definitely better sleep, and it does help. And it does help with depression if there's underlying depression. A big problem with this one, and, and the whole class of these types of antidepressants, is dryness. It causes a lot of dry mouth, dry eyes, um, and just dry skin. So it could do that, and it kind of slows the metabolism down a little bit. But it is an option, and it had been used for years for this. The other antidepressants, these are more the new ones, Zoloft, Paxil, Celexa, they do help if depression is a big trigger. If personal stresses really trigger chronic pain, these may help. But they have not really shown anything to help with chronic fibromyalgia pain. It's not really good for the pain, um, but people can take this. Now, the problem is a lot of people come in on these medications that I see, and in that case, you can't give Cymbalta, but that's another antidepressant. You really can't do multiple antidepressants. So in that case, we have to do Lyrica, really is the, is the main one, even Cybella, because it's an antidepressant in Europe. I don't really feel comfortable giving that with when someone's on these. So in that case, if we were going to add one of the approved meds, it probably would be Lyrica to that. Muscle relaxants. Um, the cyclobenzaprine or flexoril is one of the oldest ones. It's probably the best one that we get coverage for by insurance companies because the newer ones they don't really like to cover, which becomes a little bit of a problem. But that will help also if there's a lot of um, tension components or if the muscles are really hard and, and you know everyone's you know stiff with the muscles. We add an anti um, a muscle relaxant, excuse me, and that will work too. Um, newer things like the dopamine antagonists, and dopamine antagonists are basically drugs for Parkinson's disease. They're given. One of them crossed over to be the treatment for restless legs, and that's called Requip. And that has shown in studies not only to work for restless legs, but initial studies now are showing it to actually work for fibromyalgia too. I've never used it strictly for fibromyalgia, but I've used it with people who have fibromyalgia who have documented restless leg syndrome. I'll stop on that and see if it helps. Um, investigational drugs. And there are drugs now in the works that are being looked at in studies. Um, antivirals. And they're thinking that because a lot of people do have positive Epstein bar titers um, and potentially other viruses that could have triggered this, um, maybe an antiviral like a cyclovir or something would work. A cyclovir, excuse me, is typically for herpes infections like of the mouth and everything. You would give a cyclovir or shingles who would give a cyclovir. So there, it's in studies now to see if it actually makes a difference long term um, with fibromyalgia pain. Other ones are human growth hormone, which they think may help um, with fibromyalgia. 
and help regulate other hormones in the body. The problem with this one is the only method of delivery is injection. Uh, I don't really see that as being a practical option for people to get weekly injections of this hormone, um, but they have to come to a doctor's office to get that. So again, it's in the works. It's showing some promising data, um, but that's still not approved yet. Um, DHEA, or androgens, these are basically hormones um, that are given to help with pain and other autoimmune conditions as well, and lupus. Um, lupus is the big one they use it with. But there's studies with this, looking at this in fibromyalgia right now. Um, again, it's been about 50-50 improvement, so I don't know if that's actually going to get approved for the diagnosis, but it's being looked at. And the last one is something called transcranial direct current stimulation, which is, um, I think I have the next slide on this one. Yeah, this, um, it's basically electromagnetic wave therapy they're doing now for studies to try to kind of stimulate the brain to stop, almost to stop actually releasing the substance P. But it's, it's a stimulation, like electrical stimulation to the brain. You have little kind of probes in the brain and they stimulate it. So I don't know. I mean, we do now electric shock therapy, which sounds barbaric, but we still use that to treat depression. This may be something, not to treat depression, but to treat basically the, um, the release of some of these toxic hormones in the, from the brain. Okay, true or false? Non-pharmacological therapies, such as physical therapy, acupuncture, acupressure, do not work in fibromyalgia. False. False. Great. Um, they actually work very well, and they're a great supplement to medications. And there are some people who don't want to take any medications, and, uh, and they're against meds, and this is the way we need to go. Um, cardiovascular fitness training is very good. The best, best, best one is water therapy, and I really push this with patients who have fibromyalgia. It's the only, only type of exercise that won't hurt the joints, won't hurt the muscles. When you're in the water, you're in a weightless environment, so you're able to move and able to, to, to get better range of motion of your joints, and it does reduce chronic pain. Um, and uh, everyone tells me, yeah, I feel great while I'm in the water. I get out and I start aching again. And that's true, but over time, it will extend to when you get out of the water, too. And it has to be an overtime thing. Um, walking is great unless it, uh, as it's on a flat surface. No inclines with walking because that can irritate the back and, and cause trigger points. Um, stationary bike is also another great exercise, too. Um, they found in studies it definitely causes a decrease in intensity of the trigger points, um, decreases in all overall pain, and it increases your exercise tolerance, which is an important thing. Um, muscle strengthening, they found, which is like light weight lifting, nothing heavy, nothing heavy at all, but like five pound weights or so, actually decreases depression symptoms and also increases muscle strength, and over time it will decrease tender points. So that's something else. Um, hypnotherapy, this is something you could do. We, another name for this is biofeedback therapy. And in patients who don't respond to the traditional physical therapies and um, aquatic therapies or water therapies, hypnotherapy actually does work. And it's almost like a counseling kind of therapy, but you need to go to a center like a psychologist or so to, to do this. So it's, it's, it definitely has been proven to work. It's just getting people to actually do that. You know, no one wants to be labeled that. I'm like, well, it's not a psych problem. And I, it's not, but it does help you know, deal with chronic pain. Um, acupuncture or trigger point injections. Less beneficial, but some patients say it works. And what they actually do is go into these trigger points, which you have, and they put the needles in, and they try to irritate that area in the thought that the muscles are gonna reset themselves. And in, in some people it does work. Like you irritate that area and also then everything kind of relaxes and they get pain relief from it. So acupuncture does work. Acupressure is just the same thing except without the needles. And you actually go in with your fingers and you, and you get somebody to move these tiny points and try to release the muscles. Um, there are centers in the area that do this. It's not very common. And unfortunately, some insurances will not cover this, so it becomes a little bit costly. But they are options. Um, they found that um, basically all these modalities, this is just showing this, basically reduces chronic pain. So in conjunction with some medications, it will decrease the chronic pain. That's basically what this is showing. So I do recommend um, exercise. Physical therapy is another option besides the water therapy, physical therapy. 
Um, and isometric exercises, basically the stretching exercises work better. So I will write that down as script for a lot of patients for therapy to get more of a stretching exercises rather than actually strength building. Um, most useful, if you were going to do it, like people want to go to the gym, I said, what can I do at the gym? Um, Pilates-based stretching. So stretching exercises really do work. Yoga. Yoga is great for this. Um, so it's another condition you would recommend. Um, low impact aerobic ac activities such as again walking stationary bike and stretching is so important even at home stretching is very important so sometimes I send people physical therapists to just get stretching exercises and just do those at home every morning and it does help and things to try to avoid as far as exercises weightlifting again no more than like five pounds but weightlifting can aggravate this um, jogging can aggravate this Rowing is a lot of upper body can aggravate this. Any impact sport like skiing, um, anything like that, wrestling, if guys do that, all aggravate it. So I don't recommend any of that to do. So um, improvements in aerobic exercise versus non-controlled. They found that basically here's people with exercise versus these people in the yellow are without. And they saw the aerobic performance, their exercise tolerance went up people who just do mild exercise in fibromyalgia. Um, their tender point threshold, meaning that they had a 35% improvement in their tender points, they, they, they actually had a decreased pain sensation, versus people who do no exercise, it actually got worse over time. And the pain intensity got much improved while it actually increased in people who did not do exercise. So exercise is a, is a huge part of this. And I tell patients too, don't go out, because a lot of people want to exercise and just go out like, oh, I'm going to run a mile today, or I'm, I'm going to walk a mile today. You can't do that. You're going to pay for it. It's starting very slow and slowly, slowly progressing. And people, some people say, well, that's going to do nothing for me. It, 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 at first, you may not think so, but if you start even like a minute a week, just walk a minute, to, whether it's to your mailbox and back, great. Next week, go up to like three minutes a day. Just walk three minutes a day. And that's it. And it may seem like nothing. Before you know it, like in two months, you're up to about 10, 15 minutes a day. And you're like, well, I couldn't do this before, now I can. So it has to be a very, very slow progression. Okay, true or false? There's a specific diet used to treat fibromyalgia. No, that's false. Unfortunately, there's been nothing proven. Um, you go out on the internet, and I've done this, and there's multiple sites. They have, everyone has a different theory, what may help, but none have been ever proven effective. And we think, because everybody's body is actually different, everybody has different triggers and sensitivities to food, um, and basically, nothing has really been proven. Um, a book I always mention, and I don't know, this book, oh, yeah. we always mention this one book to our patients that seems to help. And um, it's, again, not approved by the American College of Rheumatology, but it's called Eat Right for Your Blood Type. And I've given this to a lot of my patients. Um, I think it's Dr. D'Amato is the, the author to this, but if you know what your blood type is, it tells you certain foods to avoid based on that. Because we think that certain people can't process the proteins in certain foods based on their blood type. And when they do, it causes this chronic inflammation, it causes abdominal bloating, um, like irritable bowel symptoms, fatigue. And I've given this to about, let me say, 20, 25 patients already, and they've been reliable patients that I know that are actually follow through with this and it's worked, and people have lost weight, they felt great with it, so there may be something here, but there's nothing uniform that says there's a diet, but it's something to look into if you're interested. Um, true or false, there are herbal supplements used for fibromyalgia. There are true. There are some that work, and um, these are some that have been looked at that may reduce pain. Is it dramatic? No. But some people swear that these things may help. Um, some to promote sleep. If people don't want to take a sleep aid and they can't sleep. Um, valerian root, lavender, something called skull cap. But again, you have to check with other medications you're on to make sure they don't cross react. So you have to ask your, you know, pharmacist or so just to make sure. Um, bowel cleansing. Some people have like irritable bowel stuff, and they tell me about these coated garlic, black walnut, grapefruit seed <coughs> extract to try to get toxins out. Um, again, not approved, not, no studies have been done with this, but some people tell me it does work. Probiotics is actually something 
that I do promote in people, especially who have been on chronic antibiotics for infections. Um, a lot of times then you get an overgrowth of bad bacteria in the bowel and the gut, and giving this may actually help. So um, to replenish the good bacteria. Um, malic acid is something along with magnesium that may help with chronic pain. B complexes, they help with energy and they help with chronic fatigue, so that's something you could do. And then 5-hydroxytryptophan, um, it raises naturally the levels of serotonin, which is one of the levels that is decreased in fibromyalgia. So, something you can try. Um, investigational meds, like I said, the growth hormone is one. Um, another one, this trovisectin, is an IV medication that increases the level of serotonin, and then the oral tryptophan too. So, now, true or false? Most people with fibromyalgia will eventually go on disability. False. That's false, actually. Um, unfortunately, people with fibromyalgia continue to have pain and chronic fatigue, but disability is actually something I do not recommend for this. Um, because the majority of people will get better, and I do think being in a work environment um, and, and doing daily activities increases um, socialization. It, 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 it helps with depression, it does, and it can deal with your level of pain better because your mind is also being not focused on it. So I think it's a good thing to work, and I try not to get people on disability when they have fibromyalgia. I do think it's a good thing. And we just got to work on controlling the pain, basically. Okay, true or false? Should I initially go to my primary care physician for a diagnosis and treatment of fibromyalgia? That's actually true. The primary care doctor should be the one to do the initial evaluation and treatment for it. Um, and if that doesn't work, then going to a specialist, such as a rheumatologist like myself, is more to then. But it's always good when the primary care doctor gets an initial workup and then you have something to go by right away, or at least you try something, because it does, you know, most people will get relief with something. So, but if not, then it's going to another specialist. So, I'll tell you, a lot of the patients I get for fibromyalgia comes to me for something else completely, like to treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, and I see them like, this is not rheumatoid arthritis, it's actually fibromyalgia. Or um, a treatment of like, you know, just like chronic pain, um, and it becomes fibromyalgia related to like Lyme disease or something like that. So a lot of times I'll get patients when they don't even come in for this diagnosis and it ends up being this. So but the initial workup should be done. So conclusion, it's basically a comprehensive approach is needed with this, this disease, whether it's medications, education regarding it, counseling in some patients, exercise, again, extremely important, and then whether we call it CAM or herbal complementary medicines are very good with it as well. So, um, so again, a comprehensive approach to it. You want to get the body in balance because it's usually off balance. Um, um, it's associated with, just a summary here, chronic other conditions like migraine headaches and abdominal pain is associated with as well, or irritable bowel syndrome. But education is extremely important and I do encourage people to even contact the American College of Rheumatology or on the Arthritis Foundation. There is adequate information about this. They have pamphlets and information to read. Um, and then the last thing is really exercise, which um, is, is really stretching and, and doing some mild exercise is really important in this condition overall. So that's it. Is there any questions regarding this or thoughts anyone has? Yeah. Um, on page three of the PowerPoint, where the handout we have, mm -hmm. the slide that says conditions uh, for most of the mistaken for fibro, are the majority of those conditions diagnosed through blood work? Yes, mm -hmm. they will be. Um, then on page nine, the middle slide, would you tell me what the an acronym CRF and ACT is? Sure. Cortisol releasing factor is CRF, and then um, the ACTH is basically the hormone that's responsible for the release of cortisol. So it's kind of this, this hormonal pathway that goes from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland down to the adrenal gland. Those are all the hormones along the way. So there could be dysfunction in that whole axis there, basically. And the adrenal gland is the one that makes cortisol 
it makes sex hormones, it, it, it basically keeps the metabolism going. So. I don't know how to put this. I, I've been dealing with fibromyalgia for like 10 years. I've mm -hmm. been around it. I don't have it. Uh, I've seen all the medications tried from opiates to Sabella. Well, that's one thing, Every, opiates. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, opiates are, should not be used in fibromyalgia. I think that's almost a, like a vicious cycle with right. that. Okay, then, I've seen that cycle. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. The thing is, when all this is said and done, uh, our goal is to get people back to work, get them feeling healthy, get their, their physical being up to par. Everybody wants to be normal, it seems like. Everybody here is like fighting. I want to be normal. I want to be like I used to be. When it's all said and done, uh, is there, say a person feels good again and they're back to normal, what is the chemical change that you would notice in their body that you would say, oh, this person's healthy and normal again? The end result, what is it? What are, what are the, the, the criteria to say? What is what is in the body? What is in the blood? We can't measure that. I don't know. That's What's the whole, there? Well, what that's is the whole the thing. We don't know what changes. Because we, we don't measure the chemical levels. We can't measure that. Now, where, how do you say a person can go back to work, a person can come off disability? <clears throat> What's the change? Or where, where is it? Is it constant treatment for the rest of your life? Some people it is, yeah. Some people it's a constant treatment. What I do is I do it clinically. It's, it's completely a clinical diagnosis. When I see their tender point levels go down, when I see that they're more active, they're getting out and doing things they couldn't do before. What's changed? Well, what in the body has changed then? You know, what, what's the change? You see that the tender points are better. You see that they're more active. Mm -hmm. What inside now has changed? Is it a mental thing that It could changed? be. It could very well be a mental thing. It could absolutely be. Again, I don't, we don't know what changes. Again, because we can't measure things, exactly what's going on neurologically, we, we can't measure that. So whether it's a better control of depression, whether it's a better control of sleep habits has changed, whether there's less stresses around the person has changed, that all, all affects the quality of life and all affects how a patient can function. I mean, I'm dealing with the restless leg, the, the no sleep, the no, uh, Physical activity. Are you personally dealing with it yourself? I, I, saw, you, I saw you falling asleep a little bit too. I'm like, oh my god. No, I, 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 oh, okay. I work a different shift. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's why. Oh, that's, that's tough yeah. too. Um, yeah, it, it's so hard. It, it's so hard to say what changes. We don't know. We don't know. We think it's multifactorial. Um, I've tried everything. It is. And that's why you have to try different approaches to things. Whether And some people, I, I've seen people, their stress is going from their current situation, they do better. As people who lose weight and they start exercising also, they're like, you know what? My exercise, um, like that slide showed, my pain level, my tolerance for pain has improved tremendously. And that helps too. Um, and we don't know, I wish there was something, again, I wish there was a blood worker, I wish there was a uh, hormone that we could measure saying, wow, this is improving. So you should be improving, you know, it is working. But we don't have that, we don't have that, like, something to actually concrete, definitively say that you have improved versus other diseases that I do treat. We, 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 won't, we um, check something called the sed rate, and I know once that comes down, your inflammation is down, or your muscle enzymes have come down. I know you're improving to therapy. I, there's nothing to measure there. So it's basically a clinical thing, how the person functions, and and what changes that is it's, it's probably a multifactorial. It's probably multiple things that help. I, that. I've seen the doctors that are just completely opposite than you. They say there's no such thing as fibromyalgia. Right, and there's still, because there's a lot of, um, and I, I come across that, you're right, a lot. A lot, especially of older physicians, when this was not even really considered a diagnosis, they um, they don't believe in it. A lot of, there's still a lot of people who don't believe in it, and it actually does exist. There's criteria for this. And again, I think it's good that they're finding a genetic link to this to make it more, that yes, this is something. There's something abnormal with the chromosomes that causes people to have this condition. So it, it, it's getting more attention, which is good, and more acknowledgement, which is good, because it was always really contributed to depression and anxiety and stuff like that. So when it's not just that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the fibroid disease is treated, do you typically see fibroid disease? Improving. 
Yeah, do you? And if it doesn't? If it doesn't, then we have to treat with fibromyalgia, yeah. I always try to get the underlying condition taken care of first. <coughs> um, and if that doesn't improve it, then we, we look into the treatment for fibromyalgia. So, but yes, it does. It, in a lot of patients... Um, do you find that if it doesn't improve with the treatment of the hypothyroidism or whatever, that you would look for another cause first, or would you just jump into treating the um, Assume that it was from the hypothyroidism. Yeah, because the initial workup I would do would include like, the thyroid and, and everything else. So I would do the whole panel initially. And um, even if somebody, I even do it people who are on thyroid meds with a history of it, mm -hmm. I always recheck their thyroid because sometimes they're not the normal dose and it's not being adequately treated. Or, um, and I do a complete workup at that point. And then if nothing else shows, then I'll just, you know, and the thyroid is good, then we treat for fibromyalgia. Yeah. There's someone here first. Yeah. What is um, you could do hormonal levels in perimenopausal women. And then in diabetes, you'll do something called a hemoglobin A1C. Um, and the thyroid, you'll do a, a TSH or 3T4 you can do. Um, some patients, when I can't find anything going on, they don't check cortisol levels, because that's not as common with the cortisol, the one that you were asking with that. It's not as common to have a deficiency in those. It's more rare of the disease. But when I can't find anything and I'm treating, nothing's happened, then we'll check that out. So. Um, yeah. What were you oh, back for pregnancy? <laughs> <laughs> well, February first, I'll be back. Yeah, I'm going out November third, and then I'll be back February first. Yeah. Yes. How does one bring the set rate down? Is there any way to bring that down? Well, the set rate—that's a, a very non-specific test, and that could be from a multitude of conditions, ranging from infections to cancers, God forbid, to autoimmune conditions. It depends on what the underlying condition is and how to bring the sed rate down. If it's an infection, you treat the infection, the sed rate goes down. If it's an autoimmune problem, a lot of times we have to give steroids or we call them immunosuppressant agents where we basically suppress your own immune system to bring it down. If it's cancer, it's only going to be the treatment for that. Um, so it, it really depends on the condition. I've also seen the sed rate go up in diabetics. Poorly controlled diabetics, the sed rate will go up because diabetes induces an inflammatory state in the body. So in that case, when there's nothing else you do work up, nothing else you can find, you really got to get the sugars down, and the sub rate will come down then too. So, yeah. so it, it's not a strict you know, mm -hmm. answer. Yeah, I'm diabetic, but I, I, you know, it's 6.8 is the A1C. That's good. That's so. good. But um, does this um, fibromyalgia, can that be caused? By a high sub rate? No, by? Um, prescription drugs? Um, no, we don't really think prescription yeah. drugs. Now, I'll tell you one thing um, with medications, and I should mention it doesn't cause fibromyalgia, but will cause a lot of mimics to fibromyalgia. The statins, the cholesterol meds, will cause chronic muscle pain, and in that case, the muscle enzymes are not elevated. So that becomes confusing too because the blood work is normal, but people have this chronic muscular pain, but it's, it's different. It's not like the true fibromyalgia mm -hmm. tender point, it's more everywhere, muscle. And people, they always, it's a different pain, they always complain that my muscles hurt, it's my leg, I can't get up, and um, it's a different type of pain, but the cholesterol meds can do it. Um, I think I saw it on my, I saw it on one of my, you know how you read the side effects and then you don't pay attention to them right. until the aching started. And I thought, you know what, I saw that on one of my yeah. medications. I went and got a print out of everything but the um, the one for cholesterol. Yeah. And I, I bet guarantee that's the it's one. that one. I yeah. Also, I blood that. pressure medicine. Some of the blood pressure medicines can do it. Um, the class that I see the most is the beta blockers, actually, mm -hmm. that can do it, which is a topolol, um, topolol itself. Um, and a lot of people are on those meds. And they some, can cause it too. You say some blood pressure mm -hmm. medications? Yes, yeah, so you got to look it up on there. Some of them can cause muscular problems. So. Yeah. Is there any role in treatment for uh, with the ribose? With DRIBOS, I, right. I didn't see anything with that. No, okay. <laughs> no, I haven't. Do you find that a lot of the patients have underlying conditions along with fibromyalgia? Because I was never diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot do. A lot have some underlying medical problem with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I'll, and you really have to address those medical problems before the fibromyalgia will ever get better. So, yeah, but I do. It is, obviously. Yeah. Does 
This affects um, C-reactive protein, which is another marker of inflammation in the blood that is separate. No, it should not affect that. No. Um, this one is over here. Yes. I have a question. Um, I've taken Larica, mm -hmm. but I'm also taking opiates. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been going through this for, I guess, five years. And going to, to the neurologist, all different types of doctors. And my question is, I did start to feel better on Larica, mm -hmm. but I was also taking the opiates. Right. So I really wasn't sure. Which, which one was it? Why? Right. right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've been off and on on both of them. So. I, I would prefer my algae definitely stick with Erica. Again, I don't, opiates have never in any study been proven to reduce the, the pain of fibromyalgia because, again, it's not like um, you broke a joint and you have like bone pain or anything like that. This is more of a neurological pain um, that we need to control with kind of regulating hormonal levels. And opiates don't do that. So some people feel better because they have other underlying pain, like arthritic pains, and that maybe the opiates will help with that. I mean, I felt wonderful, but then I noticed it wasn't like really a change. And then when I went to Lyrica, that seems to help get a different treatment you know, phrase. So. Right, it helps differently, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just want to follow up for this lady about mm -hmm. the sed rate. Um, when you said you have to treat what's causing the sed rate, right. how do you decide? Is that further mm -hmm. blood work? Or mm -hmm. Okay. Rather diagnostic tests, yeah. Does nitric oxide supplements help in the muscles? No, they have, that has not been proven in any. You know, it may help with muscular pain, nitric oxide, if there's peripheral vascular disease underneath it, that can help dilate blood vessels, but that's another underlying problem that's treated, but not, not the problem now. Okay. Great, well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate you coming. Thank you.